the operations and running a business is just as important as your creativity. Business of Architecture, episode 383. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. This week I'm speaking with Mark Weaver and Daryl Wilson of Mark Weaver Associates. Mark Weaver Associates is a full service design firm based in Los Angeles and they were founded in 1970. And since then they have built an impressive portfolio of work with residential installations, they've worked on private aircraft, yachts and even private island retreats in a vast array of locations from Los Angeles to New York City to here in London and also in Italy. Now, Mark has been recognized by a breadth of national and international publications, which has earned him a loyal following of clients from around the world. He regularly lectures at UCLA and was a founding member of both the LA Museum of Contemporary Art and the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. Daryl is a Principal is the principal designer at Mark Weaver Associates, and they've been working together for the best part of 20 years. And his approach to design has really been shaped from a wide range of influences from mid century Italian and French furniture to classical architecture. And Daryl's perspective is very much from an architectural background. In this episode, we discuss how. Mark and Daryl create long-lasting client relationships that bring regular projects into their business and that last for decades. We also talk about how to navigate the time-based pricing versus value-based pricing conundrum that many architects and designers face in their businesses. And we also look at how to responsibly manage your client's money within a project. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mark Weaver and Daryl Wilson. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Mark, Daryl, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you both? Great. Good morning, Ryan. Nice to be here. Good morning, Ryan. I'm I'm well. I'm very well. Excellent. So I'm very excited to be um, speaking with you. Mark, you are the the founder of um, Weaver Associates. Um, You started the business in 1970, I believe. Yes, correct. Now, now that's that's a, um, a an amazing amount of time and breadth of experience to have kind of built a business, particularly in such a you know fierce competitive industry. And I'm sure that you've seen both of you have seen the industry kind of evolve and shift and change a lot uh, over in that period. So, this, but the first question is, how did the business start? Well, it started um, actually. Uh, quite by accident. I didn't intend on starting a business, but I was uh, out of college and had worked for a designer um, for a little over a year. And while I was working for them, I wanted, I had a couple things I wanted to do on my own. And so I got a a business certificate and sort of established the name of the company. And um, so it was, it was a viable business so that when I um, stopped after the first year of working with somebody else, um, I thought I'd give it a try for myself. And, you know, I was young, naive, and um, it was quite a while before I got the business going. You know, I was young, struggling, and um, but eventually um, started um, accumulating clients and um, making the business uh, move forward. How, how in those early days do you remember how you got those first projects well yes one of them was from the designer that i had worked with it wasn't a, a project that was large enough for him to take on so he had given them my name and said call mark and um, maybe he can help you and another was a client that i had uh, done some work for for the company that he was with so he had asked me if i would do his uh, his residence and 
it's very interesting because that was in 1970. And today those people are still our clients and um, are still very close friends. Fantastic. That, so that's, well, what's, what's some of the secrets to maintaining client relationships over a, a period, which is, you know, several decades? Well, I think both Daryl and I are, we're both hands-on and we're very attentive to our clients' needs. We, we go to great length um, to talk to the clients, find out what they want, what their lifestyle is. Um, I, the majority of our clients today are repeat and we've done many, many homes for them or residences, offices, whatever. But um, I, I think we're, uh, our clients are extremely loyal to us because we pay a lot of attention to details on their project. They appreciate that we put our heart and soul into it. And, um, and we treat them with dignity. We treat them with great care. Mm. And um, we, don't, we don't need to get in arguments with clients. We, we find out what they need. If they don't like something, we correct it and, and make it right. So we're, I think we're very, oh, I don't know. How would you describe it, Daryl? How would you? Well, I, I would say that our clients are, to a certain degree, our friends. Or in a lot of cases, they're our friends. And we treat them, the relationships are very personal and intimate. Since we're dealing with something that's so intimate most of the time with residences, you get to know, you know clients very well. We spend days with them selecting and picking items or talking about the architecture. So you develop a rapport with them and you, 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 you listen to them and you understand them. And you know, you you do your best to give them the best possible outcome that suits them. We're, mm-hmm. we're very much about not having a sort of standard design that we are known for that we give to someone. It's a very personal interaction, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's the color you like or whether it's the type of space you like that we, we, we're very attentive to. How how do you maintain that kind of fine line between friendship and being overly friendly, but also maintaining a business relationship, and particularly if things like late invoices happen or, you know, or something starts going wrong? How do you balance those two those two types or um, kind of qualities of the relationship? We don't tend to have those sort of difficulties. Right. We're very upfront. Um, our paperwork is very clear about how we bill, um, what is expected, what things were cost. We don't, you know, some companies have a little bit of mystery in terms of the billing. Ours is very clear cut. Um, I'm not sure what you would say to that, Mark. Or- well, I think it's very, our clients appreciate, they know we're, we're um, working in their interest 100%. Mm. So, um, every once in a while, they'll question an invoice or something, and we'll explain to them what we did, and it's usually not a problem. But our clients are, I think, more than happy to pay us for services because they they know that the result is going to be spectacular, and they're paying for what they're getting. So, and um, we're very fair about the billing. Would you be able to walk us through how you kind of begin that negotiation process of, you know, determining the fees and then what kinds of things are included in your contracts? Well, our, our agreement is pretty, uh, it's a, it's a very simple agreement and it, it discusses what our uh, duties are as designers or architectural consultants. And um, it talks about um, our hourly fees and it, it lists, um, each person, whether it's an administration, a project manager, or a principal such as Daryl or myself, and what our hourly rates are. And it also talks about the markup that we make on merchandise as we purchase merchandise, art, and so forth, antiques. And it's all very, it's spelled out, and it's, it's quite easy to understand. So, um, and, and that hasn't really changed over the years. We had the same basic agreement. Um, our hourly naturally has gone up over the years mm-hmm. to keep up with um, current business rates. But other than that, it's pretty much been the same. And have you always, um, how have you worked out your 
fees, if you like, because it's interesting when we talk about hourly billings, for example, because obviously with a, a business that's been around since 1970, an hour of your time is wildly different because it's because of the experience that you've got than say a brand new practice that's just that's just started and you might be able to you know both of you would be able to in an hour's conversation provide a huge amount of value because of that experience so how do you how do you navigate that and still remain competitive with 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 fees and prices Daryl, go ahead i'm not sure i mean we uh I think they're at the level of design that we work in. Yeah. There's a certain appreciation for the quality of what you're going to get for the price you're going to pay. So there's an understanding that it's, you know, if you go to a law firm, if you hire the principal, you know, who's had multiple years of experience, you're going to get a very different outcome than if you have, you know, someone who's a new lawyer who hasn't had as much experience. And I do think there's an understanding of that within the community of people we work for. Um, of course, there, you know, sometimes we have to negotiate a contract based on the size and scope of it so that our, our fees are generally pretty set every once in a while. There's a little bit of, 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 of conversation about, could we do a different percentage, a slightly different percentage since we're, doing a project of such magnitude got it got it that makes sense um and when and when did your relationship begin working uh, when daryl when did you join the business so i joined the business around 2000 um i had been working for some other firms in uh california uh originally i came out here to go to art school uh -huh. uh, in 96 and I met Mark through a former associate who said, oh, you should go talk to, you know, Mark Weaver. He's a great guy, designer. And the rest is kind of history. We, we, we kind of fit, you know, very, very easily. What's, what's been some of the, the kind of key aspects to that relationship being so successful? I think, um, you know, our relationship over the, the 21 years that we've worked together has changed quite a bit and evolved. And, yeah. and um, what we do has evolved because um, Daryl's background is, is architecture and mine is interior design. And um, we just, you know, I think what makes it work is we're both... Um, I, th I don't think either of us has an enormous ego, which is one of the problems in this profession. I think a lot of people let their ego get carried away with them. And um, our goal, our mutual goal together is what Daryl just said a little bit earlier, is to give the client the absolute best that we can create and educate them, inform them, show them possibilities they may never have thought of. And so to find somebody that you can work with on a daily basis, just period, is very difficult. Mm. And sometimes you go through several employees, um, whether they're in administration or project management, till you find a good fit. But to find somebody um, as a principal who you can work with and is not just talented, but you can work alongside them, you can bounce ideas off one another. You know, if Daryl comes up with an idea and, um, and it's better than what I came up with, I always say, Daryl, this is brilliant. How do you think of that? <laughs> and on the other hand, if I come up with something and he doesn't like it, then he'll say, okay, Weaver, that's the stupidest thing I've heard. But, and neither of us gets bent out of shape. We both are there. We enjoy the process. It's part of the fun. We don't take it so seriously. And we do that with our clients. We joke with them and we try and have, um, we try and make this a, an exciting and enjoyable process. So I think personality wise, it's just great to find somebody that you can go to work with every day um, and you know, collaborate with them and that it's enjoyable experience and you don't go home at the end of the day going, oh God, I, I hope that's the last time I ever have to see that person. You know, um, Daryl's like having my brother at the office, you know, he's there and, and if I need 
um, somebody to talk to, I can sit down with him and, and go through something. And, and likewise, we can do. I mean, we, we have a, you know, it is like family in the office. You know, we, we spend a great deal of time together, and, but we also respect each other. I think sometimes in, in firms, there's a, an entrenched hierarchy where you're not, in some cases, even allowed to question someone else's idea, particularly a principles. And that's not the case. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, one of the more junior people who comes up with a great idea. A great idea is a great idea. And we, we celebrate wherever it comes from and, you know, run with it. The other thing that I would say is that the balance of my background with architecture and Mark's background in interior design, it, that kind of is a more complicated relationship because Mark has a very strong interest in architecture, always had neoclassical, very well vested and very well, you know, sort of educated about architecture. Um, I have an interest in furniture and furnishings, you know, as well. So while our strengths come from different places, we're able to hear each other on the effects of, oh, there, there might be something architecturally that seems like it should be this way, but if it doesn't make sense in terms of a design and decorative approach, mm. then we have to look at it and find a, a, something that is a happy medium that is actually the best possible combination of the two. How, how, do, how do you guys then um, define the roles that you each have? And how, how would you define the roles in terms of their overlap and also in terms of their differences, both design and in the business? Um, well, it, that's um, Daryl's, Daryl's been handling, I think that's evolved over the years, that's changed. And um, right now we're extremely busy. So our roles have become probably even more defined, but Daryl has been handling all of the um, architecture and construction for us. And, um, you know, since that's his background, he's, he's really brilliant at this overseeing projects, um, the construction, working with the architects, the contractors. Um, we both work on all the projects together. We have weekly meetings and review everything, but we both can't be at the same place at the same time. So if Daryl needs to be at two meetings at the same time, I'll take one, he'll do the other. But generally, um, in recent times, he's been handling all the architecture and overseeing construction. And then um, when it comes to the interiors and the furnishings, we all set down together as a team in the office. Everybody's included in this. And we incorporate the client's wish list and their desires along with um, the different directions we think this project is going to um, head into. So, and I um, oversee the operations of the office. Um, when I'm not there, Daryl, you know, we, we don't, that role is, is not mine or his, we do it together. We make sure that everything's operating properly, that um, every person within the office um, has the information they need. We answer questions. So we both oversee the operations. And, and um, because I guess I've been at this a little bit longer than Daryl, um, a lot of these clients over the years have become friends. And so um, a, great a great proportion of our business, is, as I said, is repeat. So, and if new projects come in, we interview the new, pro uh, the new client and whether we can do this together individually depends on where we are at the moment. Um, Daryl's been traveling quite a bit to the East Coast for business um, this last year. And um, today I'm in Santa Barbara working and we have um, about four projects um, in works in, in this area. So um, Daryl's in Los Angeles today. So we work around each other's schedule and we just make it work. It I would also add to that, that when we're working on a project in terms of roles, it's good to have someone come in who may not be focused on what you're doing right. so they can say, oh, 
did you look at it this way? And, you know, both in terms of whether it's the architectural side or the design side, a lot of times when I've been so completely focused and looking at something, it's hard to see the alternative. And that's where Mark or anyone else in the staff is helpful. And I think that same thing happens in terms of the, the furniture and furnishings. So we collaborate. There's never, a, there's never really a my way or the highway moment with us. Yeah. There's never been, there's never been buttings of heads. Oh, once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> How, so in, in, in terms of the, the business roles, if you like, things such as marketing and client acquisition and perhaps, you know, dealing with internal finance and cash flow management, who's, who kind of oversees those, those elements and, and who oversees the kind of um, business development aspects of the business? Was that, is that shared as well? Well, it's shared. We also have a, um, um, an office manager accountant that has been with us for, I don't know, I think maybe 15 years. And um, he's very loyal. And um, we always work together. Um, and, you know, if, if there's a question of um, procedure, everything, I think we sit down and we work it all together so we all understand it. So um, as designers, you know, designers aren't, aren't always the greatest business people, but after so many years of doing this, I like to think that, you know, I finally figured it out. So accounting is still something that's a bit of a, a mystery to me. I never understand exactly balance sheets, but I do understand the bottom line and profits and so forth. So I don't know, we, we work that out together and, and Edward in our office has been a tremendous help for us too. So it's, it's a matter of getting the right people um, in the right position to keep the business going forward. You've obviously the, with the business of um, with such kind of pedigree and history as yours, you've, you've also weathered successfully a number of recessions that happen periodically, right? And for, and for a younger business, this can be a very frightening and scary thing. How, you know, you've, you know, you've, you've, You've obviously whether the 2008 recession, 2000, and then ones that were happening in early 90s and the 80s, the dot coms. How have you successfully been able to navigate through those stormy economic times? Oh, that's a, that's really a great question, and this is something that um, I talk. Um, I, I lecture at UCLA. And that's one of the things I talk to the students about is how to um, run a business, how to run a business efficiently, um, intelligently, and what you do because over a period of years, like you said, your business goes up and down and, and it's not the interior designer architecture, but it's all businesses. Yes. So and we're, all, we're all going through um, economic downturn at the same time. So um one of my clients um, who's in the world of finance said to me when the 2008 recession, hit, I had been through the early 90s um, through that um, downturn and survived it. And it was difficult. But when the 2008, 2009 recession happened, um, we all thought we'd be, you know, out of business. I mean, just everything came to a crashing halt. So one of my clients said to me, Mark, you need to cut your overhead by 50%. And I said, that's impossible. I can't do it. And he said, well, you have no choice. It's either you do that or you're going to be out of business. And he said, this recession is going to take years to recover from. So um, Daryl and I sat down with Edward, um, our accountant, and we went through every single monthly expense, salaries, rent, automobile, you know, utilities and so forth. And we, I don't know that we cut our expenses 50 but um, we cut a substantial amount of overhead that we just couldn't tolerate. There wasn't the income. Business had just stopped. And we didn't want to lose employees. So um, we did that. And then um, about three months later, the same person came to me and said, Mark, you need to cut your expenses down another 25%. This is getting worse. And, and I, instead of saying, I can't do it, we went back and we looked at it again and we cut another 
probably 20, 25%. And, you know, we were fortunate that we have a very low loyal clientele that even during those times, they may not have been doing as large a project as we're used to, but they were um, still um, giving us work and we were operational. So I, it was a tough period, but we survived it. We're still intact. And I think we're stronger as a result of that. What do you think, Daryl? I, I think so. I, what I would add to that is that it goes back to that personal relationship with our clients, which is part of the reason they're continually repeat clients. We, we can work for a, a mother and father, and then we're working for their, their daughter or their son. So our services are also geared towards um, longevity and a commitment mm -hmm to having them in having us involved in their lives in some way, you know, as long as they, they're, they're willing to do it. Um, and I think that adds to it there. And I, I will say that one of the things that drew me to working with Mark is personality in terms of the, the, you know, as Mark said, mentioned earlier, you know, there, there can be ego in this business and there's no ego there, but there's also a belief in treating everyone involved in the process equally, whether you're the client, whether you're a contractor, whether you're making a table, they're all people who, who contribute to the process that make the end result amazing. Mm -hmm. And we, we value that at every step of the, um, the, of the way. What well, what's been uh, some of the successes or the kind of pathways that you've taken to making sure that you're hiring the best talent or that you're building the right teams that can actually help you, you know, weather these sorts of storms and kind of develop these long-term relationships? Because that's something when I speak to a lot of architects and designers, that's often some of the hardest parts of business is finding the right people. Mm -hmm. so, what, what would you say have been some of your things that you do really well that attracts the right people and makes them stay? I don't know that there is a formula for that. You know, it, 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 it's a rather random, you know, for the time period that I've been here, there have been multiple um, design assistants or junior designers. Mm -hmm. um, there have been people who've been stellar and then there have been people who weren't stellar mm -hmm. um and sometimes it's personality sometimes it's skill set but it, it to a certain degree it's really trial and error era you know it's like you you see you look at a resume you know you see all of the accolades they have and then they come in and it's you really have to see how you how you fit together yeah. how you really work mm -hmm. How how do you how do you how do you assess that? Do you have, for example, like a, a kind of defined company mission or set of values that you're kind of? We do have a mission statement. Um, we have a handbook, um, and we do reviews. We do a ninety day review, a one year review, and those are the formal aspects. But at any point if there's something we want to discuss with them in terms of whether they're doing something exceptionally or whether or not there's something that needs to be modified, we always feel like we should have a conversation. You know, it's an open door policy. When we're interviewing Ryan um, for the first time, we have a, a controller who um, sort of vets these people out for us and reduces it to two or three choices. And then we meet with these people individually, we talk to them, we sit down with them, try to make them comfortable, find out who they are, what it is they want, what they're looking for in their careers, and, um, and just being very open with them so they get to know a little bit about us and what it's going to be like working with us. And, um, and, and encouraging them and letting them know that they're going to be part of a team. They're not just being pigeonholed into one particular <clears throat> job. And so I think that's important. And, you know, like Daryl said, you never know how an employee is going to develop until they start working for you. So hopefully you've made the right decision, but that's not always the case. So if not, then you uh, make a change and you move forward. It, that's really interesting as well, the kind of being swift, if you like, about 
you know, making a change when you know it's not, not the right fit. Um, how do you know when a client is not the right fit? Do you have a similar sort of process? And have you ever, have you ever found yourself in that situation where you've been working with a client and it hasn't been a fit and, Okay, Daryl, this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, occasionally there does. Um, look, we're very service oriented. Most of our clients are a delight to be with. You know, I, I feel we're, we're extremely fortunate. Now, that doesn't mean they aren't demanding and they weren't want the level of service and the level of quality to be extremely high. But they understand and respect what we do, the majority of them. Occasionally, we run into clients that are not as receptive or, you know, and at those points, and it takes a lot for us to reach a point where we say, this really doesn't work. And in the years that I've been here, we've really only done that twice um, where, you know, clients didn't work out. And it was a question of you just kind of graciously terminating those relationships. Yes. They, they, you know, part of the issue with, you know, some of the clients is they, they don't necessarily see it coming. There's an understand. There has to be, you know, if, if you don't feel like you're getting the service you're supposed to get, then we should have a conversation about what needs to be changed or modified. And at times it's, it's simply not working, you know, you know, whether it's the, and it's usually a personality conflict, right. In terms of expectations and how they're being managed. Mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned something there. Um, you said that you're an extremely service orientated business and that's interesting. So I don't often hear designers say that. Or, or architects say that, right? They'll often say, well, we're a design-focused business. And there's a subtle difference there. For you, what, is, what, is that, what does being service-orientated mean? And also, due to the nature of a lot of your clients, you know, you're working with kind of very high-caliber clients, high net worth and individuals. What is that service for that particular demographic of, of person? Well, I believe our service, I mean, I, I, I have to look at architecture and we're, we're, our job is not to produce a thing that we then give to someone. Mm. Our job is to produce something which they want and what they were envisioning but couldn't completely envision. And we help it evolve and we help, you know, it blossom. That to me is a service. It's, it's, it's a very interactive, you know, design approach. It's not a, well, we do pink and blue rooms and this is what you're going to get. It's you know, like, if you like pink and blue and that's your thing, you know, and, and I look at our clients and they're so vastly diverse in terms of their aesthetics, price points. And, you know, you have to show the client who's thinking of, a contemporary room or a contemporary design, maybe something that has a little bit of antiquity involved in it to sort of like make it more interesting and less standard. So it's about educating, it's about broadening their perspective, but it's also about following their vision to, so that it ends up being something that they, they're just overjoyed when they come into. Right. Yeah, our approach to design isn't our way or the highway. Um, so we we direct our clients if we feel there's a uh, there's a critical mistake in in their vision or um, it's not working. We'll explain to them why. So um, we always explain the reason we design something, how we got to that um, uh, decision. And the clients, if you give them intelligent answer, they completely understand and they trust you, especially mm. after you've done, as we have, several projects for them. If you say, look, you guys, this is, this is really the right solution for this. If I wasn't so sure of it, I wouldn't um, be 
telling you to do this time after time. This is the right way to go. And usually they'll listen to what we have to say and they, they trust us. We're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for them to make this project work for them. And um, like Daryl said, our, our clients are so diverse and our projects are so diverse. I mean, we might be working on a residence on a vineyard um, in Santa Barbara County and, uh, you know, a sort of an early California mission style residence. We might be doing a contemporary house in the Hollywood Hills. Um, we're working on a couple projects in New York, one in a traditional um, building and one in a contemporary building. So our work varies tremendously. And I think that's one of the exciting things for us is that we get to do um, our, a, a wide variety of work. So it keeps us creative. And I think our clients appreciate that we're bringing um, a lot to the table for them. Maybe things that they didn't think about. We expose them ideas, new designs, new concepts, and we're always pushing to move forward and, and do something um, more refreshing. Fantastic. You mentioned there as well, you've obviously got projects right across the States. You've got projects also in now in, in other countries as well. You've, you've got an international portfolio. I know you worked in London not so long ago. Yeah, that was a project Daryl handled. So um, we did some offices. Daryl, tell them about um, the London project. I haven't even seen it yet. Oh, so our, one of our clients, one of our biggest clients, um, opened offices in London. And we had established a sort of design aesthetic, a, a sort of branding for the company right. here in Los Angeles with area architects. And we wanted to transfer that, that sort of same aesthetic there, but London's a very different, a very different climate, very different city. Um, so the project is, is very much similar to Los Angeles, but it, it, it accommodates being in London. And, you know, it was, it was a really wonderful experience to work with because in the UK, you approach um, commercial designs different than we do here. You know, the team that we worked with was a design build team. So right. they flew over and we walked them through the offices and showed them every detail of what we had done here. And then they created a package and we went back and forth. And um, I was fortunate enough to go over to see the final installation of the project. And it, it, it was beautiful. It was well executed. And, you know, it's also the challenge of dealing with different, you know, resources, mm -hmm. different you know, approaches to how you do design and build. Um, that was very fascinating. How, how yeah, did we were a great team to work with the, the people that we hired in London to um, to execute this project? They were they were so collaborative. They were so much. They were just a real joy to work with because they knew what we wanted. They knew what the client expected and um, and they'd come up with solutions when there was a problem. And it was just a, a good team effort. It was it's nice when you can get together as, as professionals and uh, work with respect to one another and, and just get the thing accomplished. There was time constraints. We had to get this company operational and, you know, we met it, we did it and we couldn't have done it without them. So Fantastic. that was nice. So hopefully I'm going to get to go to London sometime now that uh, <laughs> countries are opening up. I'd love to see the finished project. But you'd have to be quarantined for 14 days now. <laughs> <laughs> How, um, well, obviously, one of the big responsibilities that you have as designers, um, and, and, and particularly you know, the way that it kind of sometimes differs from architects and interior designers, is that um, it's not uncommon for interior designers to be gifted, not gifted, that's not the right word, but you, you're, you're, you're put in charge of you know, the bank vault, if you like, or a large chunk of money, and you're, you're actually paying for things and buying things and purchasing things. What are some of the, the lessons that you've learned around handling finance, both in that aspect and also oh. keeping projects on budget and, and dealing with finance with your clients? What are some of the lessons that you, you've learned and the most important keys to being successful at that aspect of the, of the job is? 
Well, that's, that's probably one of the most important aspects of any job is the budget, because it doesn't matter um, how wealthy somebody is. They're always, they want to know that they're taken care of, that their money is being well managed. Um, so that's a big part of our responsibility. The way we go about um, presenting, we talk to the client about a budget on a particular project, what they want to spend. And um, we do a cost analysis room by room on a project. And we set up a budget showing, um, you know, what it's going, what the bottom line is. Everything such as our hourly consultation fees, merchandise, freight and shipping, sales taxes, delivery, and so forth. And so we try and give them a complete package. And we have that as, as a worksheet, Ryan. And as we go through the project, just last week, we had budgeted X amount for a desk in the home office. And while I was shopping with a client a couple of weeks ago in New York, we found an antique desk from um, the 30s. And we said, oh my God, this is great. Let's do this instead. Well, it's, you know, six, seven times the cost. So what we do is we plug the fig, uh, figure for the new desk in and sh show them the difference, what it costs between what we had proposed and what this is. If they're comfortable with it, we proceed. But we always make sure that the client's aware of um, how much something is um, and um, we get their approval before, there's, before anything's done. So... Um, the budget is, is, you know, money is always a, a sensitive issue with people. So mm -hmm. we're very upfront. They know how much we're making. They know how much merchandise costs. It's very clear cut. And um, we just try and keep it on track. Now, the question that you had about how do you maintain a budget? Well, in, okay, so years of doing this, I don't know that any budget has ever been that's been set at a particular um, amount, it's ever ended up at that. Because everybody said, well, well, I want this. If I'm gonna, if this is gonna be the last house I'm gonna do, or, or I just want this in my bathroom, I wanna do this in the living room, it's their decision. So um, we show clients different options and ultimately um, they'll ask us what we do and we tell them, you know, the best way to spend their money. So. Um, there's always a way to perhaps you buy a more expensive fabric and you compensate by getting a less expensive table to compensate for that. So it's, it's, it's like a giant puzzle you put together, mm. both from the design standpoint and from a budget standpoint. I think that's 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 really interesting as well. But and obviously, you know, from the outset of a project, when you first begin, and a client might be talking about a budget, the reality of it is is that you don't always know what the scope of the project is in the first place. Um, and it, that is one of the things that happens, you know. So there's sort of you start off, we're going to do the living room and the dining room, and you end up doing the whole house and. It, I, I believe what Mark, I mean, we just keep the client involved along the entire process mm. so that, that there in the end, there's not a surprise like, oh, my God, I spent, you know, there, there our, our paperwork is very clear. We have something called a client status report and the client status report will show every item that we've allocated, that we budgeted, whether you purchased it, how much sales tax there's going to be on it. So it's a very clear cut bottom line that you can look right at the bottom and see this is the total you're spending for the entire project. You can look at any one of the rooms because it's grouped by rooms and say, okay, the living room is costing this much, the dining room. So we keep the clients very well informed of what we're doing. Now, in terms of the management of the funds, we're very clear about, you know, the with our markup there that we we don't mix client funds you know if this you know this is for this chair the percentage that's ours is taken out so we keep it separate and we keep a very clear cut idea of what the the, the what what are the funds for purchasing you know and then what are the funds that are our percentages um and what is our profit so we, we that's a very very important thing mm. to always know where you stand with those funds yeah i think one of the um um 
pitfalls in this business is that a lot of designers will get a big project. And I've seen this happen over the years, and I've been very cautious not to do this. Um, but designers will get a big project and they'll go on an expensive trip. They'll buy new cars or buy a house. And they're dipping into the uh, money that part of that is for the merchandise that their clients are purchasing. So we're very cautious and we have never done that. We have separate accounts. We have a separate tax account. We have a separate operations account and we have a purchasing account. So when we get a check from a client, the funds that are taxes go into the tax account. Um, our profit on that, uh, of that amount goes into our operations account. And then the purchasing account is the rest, which is for the purchasing of materials. And that is never touched. It's only used for, and so it's very clear cut. And that way we can always look at our bank accounts, knowing where we're at. Mm. And, um, and we avoid the, the pitfall of dipping into your client's funds for personal or operational expenditures. Was that a discipline that you'd started from, from the outset or... Did it, did it evolve into that through your through experience? Well, I think, um, no, when I first started, I had one bank account, but, you know, it was, wasn't significant. <laughs> but, you know, over the years, it just became, it's something that I decided to do because it made things so much easier for us. I could just look at the bank account and know how much I had in operations, what my expenses were for the month. And, and um, if we were going to meet that or what we had to do, did I have to get out and hustle? So it, it's just, um, I think it's a great way to set up a business. It's worked very successfully for us. And it helps you evaluate where you are at any given point, because yeah. you know that you have this much in your operations account and whether or not you're being profitable. So, you know, one of the things we also have to evaluate is if we, we some of the jobs we, we um, if they're large jobs, we'll take them on and we charge an hour, uh, a monthly fee. Uh, in those cases, we, we continually look at our hours to see whether or not we're exceeding that. So that if we need to increase our fees in the future, we know that okay, we thought it was going to take 40 hours and it took 120 hours. So we need to, to adjust our fees to make sure that, that, that that's appropriate Yeah, for and the you, level you of work we're doing. Do this, um, constantly to remain profitable, obviously. Mm. Brilliant. Um, just to, uh, we, we were talking earlier about kind of PR marketing and 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 obviously that's a really kind of key aspect to the growth of the business. Um, what what sorts of things have you done to kind of you know be evangelical about the business, if you like? How 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 have you courted the media? What sorts of what what kinds of publishing strategies have been really important for you, or has it been more focused on client relationships? Well, I, I would say in the past, it's, it's been more focused on client relationships. And our business has been 100% referral. Right. So most of our clients have come by the recommendation of other clients. And that's been consistent over the years. In the last several years, um, you know, I'm not a social media person. This, this is all mystery to me. So... Um, Daryl's a little bit younger than me and he's probably better at it. But, you know, I, I'm not a Facebook person. I just, I don't care about social media personally. And then I realized that in this day and age, if you're not, um, if you're not involved in social media, you're not going to go anywhere. And it's all in social media today. Um, I think print and publishing, um, I hate to say this, but I think in a few years that's going to disappear. And it gradually is. I think more focus today is put on um, social media and the internet. Um, I remember the days when we used to have a portfolio of, of photographs. And when we go interview on a project, we'd bring the portfolio and you, we would always say, well, we've got to take new pictures and get this more up to date. Well, today it's all on your website. Anybody that wants to see what you're about, what you do, the type of projects you do, um, can see it on your website. 
So we try and keep our website up to date and current and show the variety of work that we do because we do offices, residences, airplanes, ships, um, vacation homes. So we do a great variety of work. Um, a lot of this can't be published. So um, we have clients that have non-disclosure agreements and we don't publish certain projects. And, um, but in the last uh, several years, we hired a PR firm and they have several younger people on staff and they've kind of brought Daryl and I into <laughs> the 21st century. <laughs> um, we've learned quite a bit about, uh, about um, how to use the media for promoting business. So um, that's been great. They get us involved in community activities, um, talks such as what we're doing with you, Ryan, right now. And about a year ago, it's very interesting, um, when COVID started and we were all sitting home, one of my best friends, who's also a designer in Los Angeles, he and I were talking and my a PR company says, why don't you do a little talk with Gary online? So we did a little chat online that was about 45 minutes long and decided to do it the following week again. And we had a number of people that watched and that turned into um, an Instagram program called designers at home with Mark Weaver. And um, it usually airs every other week on Friday at 10 AM. And it's been a program that we talk with designers, architects, art consultants, fashion consultants, contractors, um, painters, anything that has to do with the design industry. We've talked to museum curators. We talked to Daniel Kershaw, who is the um, director of design and exhibitions at the New York Met. Um, and we talked to Barbara Guggenheim, who is the leading art consultant in America. And we've had some very, very interesting people. So that's brought us a great deal of recognition. And we have these on um, our Instagram channel. We have them on our YouTube channel. Um, how to access these, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's all under Mark Weaver and Associates. And um, Daryl's going to be doing one shortly um, with an architect that we're gonna be working with shortly. Brilliant. How do, how do your collaborations work with other architects, other designers? What, what makes a successful collaboration with an external, uh, you know, set of consultants? Well, I, I think working with it, the, the bottom line, it's a collaboration. We all bring our ideas to the table. And again, I think we're very fortunate that, you know, right now we're working with Wade Weissman, um, and his team on a few projects. And again, it's that professional respect and attention to detail that's so very crucial that we see, it's, it's kind of like my relationship with Mark. We, we, we approach design in a similar way and that we want it to be geared to the, the, the person that will occupy it and that it's going to be the best possible iteration of that concept. So, you know, it's, it's, there's the, the architect that I'm working with on the, these projects, Ryan, will spend, you know, two hours on, the, on, on Zoom calls talking about various details on the project. And it's a joy because it's, it's someone who is just as excited and just mm -hmm. as committed as I am, you know, and we've worked with uh, another architect, Jock Sewell, who is just as committed to having the project be the best. And I think it comes to figuring out that balance or respect for what we both do so that we can make the project the best. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to find uh, always the right team of people. And what we try and do for the client is assemble the right team. We'll introduce a client to maybe two or three architects to consult on the project. And I always keep in mind, I think both Daryl and I think about this, what is the right personality fit for this client? Because there's a lot of talent out there, but the personalities are never going to mesh. 
So that's not going to work. It's all about personality and finding people that you can collaborate with. So we introduce them to architects, perhaps contractors, landscape designers, and we put together or we help our client assemble, of t- uh, assemble a team of people for the project. I once did a project for um, a gentleman. He owned uh, one of uh, America's major football teams, franchises. And he said, okay, I've got my architect, my designers, my contractors, my landscape architects. Um, He said, do any of you think that you can't work with one another? And we said, no, we've all worked together before. This is going to be great. And he says, good. I've got my team. Let's go. And I've always used that as an example because it was brilliant. And, and that's what it is. It's finding the great, a great team of people to get started on a project. So, but a lot of that has to do with personality and, and how that works. How, how do you? And we also, oh, well, and we also say to clients, this, you're in a long-term relationship. Right. This, is, this, is, this is not something where for a year and a half they're going to be in your lives. We're here to create something that at any point in the future, the contractor will come back and service a project or you feel like, oh, I need a little refresh in this room and I, I need a little design, we'll come back in. We want them to feel like this is a relationship. So it's very important to have that team of people who are committed to this. Hmm. Right. And then, and loyalty is important. You want, you, we want to bring people into a project where if something um, needs to be addressed, if there's a problem somewhere, they're on top of it and they're meeting the client's needs. Okay. How, how, I was going to ask like how you assess um, the relationships or, or personalities. Like what, what are the sorts of things that you might be deciding, you know what, this person and this person, they're going to be a great fit or actually this person and that person, I don't think they're going to be, I don't think there's going to be good chemistry there. Do you have an, an example of how you might work through that? Well, I think um, we do that on every project. You know, in this one case where we're working with Wade Weissman, um, we brought in three architects for the client to um, interview and we did it at their offices and we actually liked all three of them. The client was thrilled with all of them. And they said, how do we go about deciding who's going to do this? You know, um, and uh, so we had a second interview with everybody and they ultimately made a decision um, with this one gentleman because of personality, because of the completeness of his drawings. He brought a sample of his drawings. Mm -hmm. And this client has been through several um, architects, several contractors over the year. And they are so thrilled with this decision they made that he's now working on three different projects for them. And a lot of that has to do, I think it's just personality. He's accommodating, he's personal. Um, he takes the time to call the client and ask if everything's um, okay. Is there anything he can do? He's not always on the project. As Daryl said, he works yeah. uh, with one of his associates. But I think it's just a matter of being professional and making sure the client's wishes are being met. So, and, and he's just a lovely guy to work with. And that's the kind of people that we work with. We don't want to go to work every day and have arguments with people. We want to go together, throw out ideas, throw out options, and find out what's the, the most efficient and cost-effective way to get it done. Brilliant. On, final question. I think it's a perfect place for us to, to start to conclude. Um, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from your clients in terms of running a business and, and um, kind of building those relationships. Um, do you want to answer that, Daryl? You can start with that one, Mark. <laughs> okay. um, well, I think we, um, we've been very fortunate. I think in, in, in our business, um, one of the great advantages of being in the design and architectural world is that the backgrounds of our clients are so vastly different. Yeah. We have people in private equity. We have people in film and television. Um, we have people in medicine. You know, we have people in media and so forth. So um, we have a great 
resource to draw from. And we, we learn from our clients. We're very observant. We see how they conduct themselves in business, what to do, what not to do, how to behave. Um, and, you know, whenever we need financial um, guidance or um, we need to know something, we can go to one of our clients and saying, you know, we're not exactly sure how to go about this. Can you talk to us? And they're always great to sit down with us and advise us. So we have some great resources and it's been very beneficial over the years because as I said earlier, you know, designers are not always the greatest business people. You can have the most creative visionary person in the world and they can't run a business. They're never going to be successful because they don't know how to run a business. Yeah. And the operations and running a business is just as important as your creativity. Those go both go hand in hand. And I think it's also important when we're spending time with clients is just the ability to listen to them and how they're expressing their desires. So that it, it, the, the biggest thing I've learned, you know, in the transition from strictly architecture to architectural interiors or architectural design, when I was working in architecture, there, there was a rigidity to the approach so that it, it was a little bit more, it's my way or the highway. This is, this is, this is how it should be and that there is only one solution. And what's important and what I've learned in that transition, there are multiple options that are going to work. Mm. And you have to listen to the client and find out which one is going to be the best for them. How this is interesting as well, particularly coming from you know architecture school, where you know you you spend a long gestation period, if you like, working solely on projects for imagined clients, and this this when you're entering into practice, the kind of you know having to learn how to temper your own ideas with that of somebody else's. How 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 did you learn these skills, or what or what were the things that you had to give up, or did you have to give up anything? Well, I don't think it's about giving up. I mean, I think it's about opening up in terms mm. of. I, I mean, what we do is very relationship oriented. Yeah. So it's it's something that you, if you're going to go out and find a new partner or date someone, you can't approach it as like, okay, this is. You're either doing it my way or you're not. <laughs> you really have to, to be more malleable. And in architecture school, they never talked about client relationships. It was really about aesthetics, history, and so forth. So it was a little bit of a shock when I sort of went out into the world. And it's like, oh, you mean I have to, I have to listen to clients? <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's like, you know, you, you, you know, they're going to, they're going to tell me what, and, and it was, it was eye opening, but I think it makes the work much richer and much more interesting. Fantastic. Yeah. There's no greater joy than completing a job, Ryan. And the day that the client arrives at their residence or uh, whatever, <laughs> and they see the final product. And I remember one we did uh, two or three years ago, and it was a very large project. We had worked on it for five years and he had never really seen anything that we had selected. And um, she had really selected most of the merchandise, but this is a house we built from the ground up and it was rather spectacular. And the day that they arrived and they came in and just to see the look on their faces, <laughs> We had a pianist playing one of their favorite pieces of music as they arrived. We greeted at the front door with a glass of their wine that they produce. And they came into the finished product with candles lit, the fireplaces going, uh, music playing, um, flowers everywhere. And just to see the joy in their face. And he walked around the corner and was wiping tears from his eyes. And that's the greatest thrill for us. For us. So to be able to create for somebody and create for them a lifestyle and something that's unique and special is, is a great thrill. Super. Love it. What have you guys got planned for the rest of the year? 
<laughs> the rest of it. So we, we, we have the, the projects on in Miami that we're working on. Um, those will complete this year. And then we're starting on some new projects um, in Santa Barbara uh, that we're going to, you know, and we have a project in Newport Beach that we're working on. And, you know, one is Miami Deco influenced, one is Spanish colonial, one is contemporary with a little bit more sort of bling to it. So they're, they're all very different, but very interesting. Yeah, love it. Brilliant. I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude. Thank you so much, Mark and Daryl, for sharing all your insights, your expertise and the behind the scenes of how you develop relationships with clients and how you've been successfully growing the business since, since well, over a period of decades. So thank you very much. Thank Great. you, Ryan. It was a pleasure visiting with you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.